Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CCTL seminar on the history of LGBT law and rights in Hong Kong. My name is Rehana Beratna. I'm an associate professor at CUHK Law and the chair of the Comparative Constitutional Law Research Forum, which is organizing this talk. Very pleased today to be joined by our speaker, Mr. Azan Marwa. Let me just give a brief introduction. Azan is a barrister at law at Resolution Chambers. He is an experienced commercial, family, matrimonial, and public law advocate and mediator. He was called to the bar in 2012 and appears in all Hong Kong courts, including the Court of Appeal and Court of Final Appeal. He also regularly appears in front of statutory tribunals and boards. Azan is an experienced advocate and mediator in family and child-related disputes and has authored several leading publications in that area. And perhaps most importantly for our purposes, he's an experienced public law advocate, taking instructions from both government and private clients. He is particularly known for his work in equality law, working on questions of religious, LGBTQ+, gender, and dis disability discrimination. So before I hand over to Azan, let me just say, um, there will be a Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have any questions, please send them to me in the chat. Um, and time permitting, I will ask Azan some of those questions at the end. So Azan, let me hand it to you. Thanks very much again uh, for being here. Okay, uh, I'm, I can be heard now? Yes, we hear you oh, all. Great, great, fantastic. Uh, okay, let me see if I can work the slides. Hopefully you can all see. Yep, the perfect. Slide there. Fantastic. Okay, well, uh, I guess start off by saying it's a pleasure to be here, even if it's electronically. Um, uh, I'm grateful to Rehan for that very kind introduction. Um, I I do have, a, in fact, my first love, you can say academically, was history. Uh, I read history in a, in a graduate program in London uh, long before I decided I was interested in law. Um, but uh, at the same time, I, I'm not going to pretend to be a uh, doctorate in history or, or an academic history. Instead, I'll probably speak more from my own experience and, uh, and the research that I've done uh, in preparing the cases that I've done. Um, I think I'd probably start by stating the, the obvious that uh, there have always been lesbian, gay, and bisexual and what we might call today transgender people in Hong Kong. Um, maybe not uh, obviously so, but these communities, they exist naturally in all human society and uh, they are not, they're not new to Hong Kong. Uh, neither though are these fixed identities or categories. Uh, generally speaking, they should probably properly be understood in a spectrum uh, occurring naturally. And I know some academics ha have said that uh, they are as old as humanity. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about how the law has treated these parts of our society and how people have interacted, how these people have interacted with the law, uh, how they've been able or unable to exercise their rights. Um, but for the sake of brevity, I'll focus mainly on issues relating to homosexuality. Uh, this is not to say that issues related to trans and, and intersex people are not interesting or important. They are very interesting and important. And of course, if there are any questions about, about that area, I'm very happy to answer them. But uh, it's a lot, it's just a lot easier to talk about that, which there is, uh, there's been a lot more work done. Um, my own academic background, as I said, is in, is in history and then in law. But uh, I'm not going to pretend that I can, that I've approached this topic with uh, complete academic detachment. Um, I have to acknowledge my own interest in the subject matter, uh, which is neither detached nor objective. Uh, I don't claim to be a part of these historically oppressed groups, but I have spent almost my entire professional career working on LGBT issues from the activist side, seeking redress through the courts for litigants or uh, through the community as, as a whole, uh, through my work through certain activist groups. For those working in the field, it's tempting to look at the rapid change in the law and assume that it's purely legal as though the courts are simply calculators or or uh, as though they're they're digging down into the ground and finally discovering the truth or perhaps 
to assume that it's purely social, that the courts are, are merely democratic, that they reflect the society around them. Or on the other hand, some people may say that the courts are in truth political, um, that they just do what they are told by the government. But none of these uh, perspectives is entirely true or gives a, a full picture. Uh, I think it's probably better to say that, uh, that LGBT rights and law have been influenced by the broader political, social, and legal trends in Hong Kong, but not only in Hong Kong, uh, as well as, and I think this is very important, the determination and courage of a few individuals. And I will, as we go through, try to highlight where I can the, the work of those individuals. Okay, great. Um, uh, we might talk about the development of uh, LGBT law in Hong Kong in five broad periods. The, the first would be the pre-colonial, the second, the colonial period, then the period of decriminalization of homosexuality, particularly male homosexuality, uh, then the post-decriminalization period, and then the period we're finally in, which, which I've called uh, human rights litigation, or the sustained period of human rights litigation, which is really what we're going through so rapidly these days. These periods reflect overarching legal, political, and social trends, and it's no surprise that those changes are reaching a crescendo uh, right now with public and private efforts by LGBT communities and their allies to express and defend those identities and rights through both social and legal challenge. Through this talk, I, I'd like to talk how, about how far the law has come, as well as the legal, social, and political causes that have contributed to those changes. Uh, I, I, will, I also want to say at the outset, I'm uh, I much prefer receiving questions, but I think we're going to be doing questions at the end. That's right, Rehan. Great. All right, uh, the colonial. Uh, I'd be the pre-colonial. I'd be honest. This was a very difficult area to research uh, because there's very little uh, available information specifically on LGBT people in pre-colonial Hong Kong. However, we do know something about the attitudes and laws in Imperial China. Uh, I mentioned first Li and hers uh, book on the history of Chinese homosexuality. Uh, there's also a, an excellent book by Brett uh, Hinch, I believe, um, where uh, in particularly in Li's book, she explains that there's no, although there's little record of treatment of lesbian women, there's much to be said about attitudes and laws about male homosexuality. It's clear that homosexuality was common and accepted practice during uh, imperial China. Same-sex marriage ceremonies were carried out, and all of this was allowed for men, provided that they also produced heirs and married women later uh, in order to comply with Confucian notions of social obligation. Sex itself was not regarded as sinful in, in general, and the homosexual act, though generally regarded as repugnant, was tolerated by society. It was treated as a private matter, and there was a high degree of tolerance towards homosexuality through much of Chinese history. Um, I, I believe it's Brett Hinch who describes bisexuality as the norm amongst early Han emperors. I think it's all the first 10 Han dynasty emperors, all 10 of them were uh, recorded as being bisexual. Uh, the beginning of negative legal responses to homosexuality only really appears later in Chinese history. Um, uh, with the genesis of influence, uh, with its genesis in uh, foreign influence of sexual mores, particularly from Central and Western Asia. Ultimately, the first attempt to criminalize consensual private homosexual conduct was only introduced in 1740, uh, albeit punished very lightly. In fact, I, lo I looked it up. The punishment was the lowest for any poet punishment under the criminal code. Uh, it is telling that when the Qing were toppled, this prohibition was one of the first to be repealed across most of the successor states in China. Uh, now, uh, leaving what we can't say very much about to what we can say a good deal about, which is uh, colonial attitudes towards homosexuality. The arrival of the colonial government in 1841 saw an immediate change in legal responses to LGBT communities with the broad introduction into domestic law of criminal prohibitions under English law. I think most lawyers trained in Hong Kong will, will know about the introduction of British law. Um, but in the, in the context of homosexuality, uh, in England, they had previously had an offense created by Henry VIII's Act of 1533, uh, which 
automatically became part of Hong Kong law in 1844. And I, I should say at this time, it was an act punishable by death. And I think the last time an Englishman had been punished by death for buggery was in 1837. So only shortly before the founding of the colony. Uh, but this rather fits with the immediate first uh, change pretty much uh, 20 years into the colony when the uh, British Parliament modernized sexual offenses using the Offenses Against the Persons Act 1861, which the colonial government incorporated into Hong Kong law through the Offenses Against the Persons Ordinance 1865. Uh, in, and I, I think you hopefully you see on the screen there's a screenshot of uh, section 49, which introduced the crime of uh, both bestiality and buggery uh, in the same category of abominable offenses. Uh, now, importantly, this was the first pro-LGBT reform because it was no longer punishable by death. Instead, it was punishable by life imprisonment. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, whatever the status of the LGBT communities during the colonial period, the effect of this criminalization was marked by Victorian sexual mores driving LGBT communities underground. Only, a, uh, in fact, uh, you may have read in the South China Morning Post only a few days ago, there was a letter published by a local politician claiming homosexuality as a Western concept uh, and homophobia as a traditional Chinese value. I find that uh, particularly ironic because it was only during the colonial period that both Hong Kong and greater, and greater China, that Chinese homosexual tradition began to be censored and uh, as an antiquated uh, idea um, through something called the self-strengthening movement, which was essentially an effort to westernize China. And part of that was importing Western science and philosophy, but another part of it was importing homophobia and sexual mores. Um, it's understandable that in that colonial political and social context, where locally and nationally there were efforts to modernize and therefore westernize China, that the local community embraced stigmatization of LGBT communities, uh, emboldened specifically in Hong Kong by the English legal framework. Uh, and certainly this had an effect because by the 1970s, the, the first Hong Kong academic to address the status of LGBT communities, uh, Henry Lethbridge, spoke of local Chinese community, a, a local Chinese community indoctrinated with the idea of homosexuality as an European idea introduced to China. He also describes the effect of social and legal stigmatization, comparing the gay community with the triads driven under, underground into a fraternity of gay men to, uh, at risk of prosecution, blackmail, and at times violence. On the other hand, this was a fraternity that reached up to the heights of colonial society. And there was, to some extent, a tolerated community by the colonial government, a sort of uh, see nothing, say nothing, do nothing, uh, which was inclined not to investigate or pursue prosecutions unless forced forced to do so. And that was an aspect of early, early colonial policy. Uh, ultimately uh, emerged uh, this laissez-faire attitude um, to, on the one hand, suppress social freedom, uh, political freedoms, but on the other hand, loosen constraints on social and economic activity. So that by the 1960s, when England itself was decriminalizing buggery, there were few prosecutions and the police broadly adopted a blind eye approach to uh, homosexuality. However, this, uh, and this is why I come into the period of decriminalization, this is the time when the social, political, and legal trends began to collide. Uh, at the social level, you had you know, partly driven by decriminalization in other places in the West, particularly and in England, you had Hong Kong benefiting from sexual liberalization and the gay, gay liberation movement and the growing acceptance of homosexuality in Western culture, such that by 17, uh, 1978, Gordon Huthard uh, had opened Disco Disco in Lai Kwai Fong uh, in an attempt explicitly to emulate a Studio 54 uh, to celebrate uh, you know, such cultural luminaries as Diana Ross and Saturday Night Fever, a, an, an intentional effort to incorporate gay culture into uh, both the underground and the above ground culture in Hong Kong. Uh, now, uh, Gordon is a really interesting and important, in my opinion, courageous figure 
precisely because he is no longer content with being underground, uh, but he in, in, a, in effect set out to provoke prosecution. Uh, apparently in Disco Disco, he intentionally would dance with his partner. Um, now, uh, the political level, uh, as I say, there were contradictory influences. The administration, as before, when inclined to follow suit with England and wanted to decriminalize homosexuality in 1967. But at this time, the colonial policy was to legislate only where they could uh, produce a local consensus, where there was uh, uh, consent from the Hong Kong people, so as to maintain the legitimacy of the colonial government. Therefore, once the government realized that there was a broad local opposition to reform, they decided to take no action. And that was all very well and good, provided that uh, there were no complaints and nobody was doing any prosecution. But this is where, at the legal level, the politics and the society conflicted. Um, in, in 1968 and 1976, while the United Kingdom had signed and ratified the ICCPR, enshrining rights to privacy and equality. On the other hand, a series of prosecutions of well-known figures for homosexual conduct, particularly uh, pederasty, so um, sexual abuse involving young, young boys or uh, young, young men um, came to the fore. In, in essence, there were complaints that the police could not ignore. Uh, and during one of those investigations um, uh, against a European solicitor, who was uh, being pro uh, prosecuted and investigated for abuse of these young boys, one of the boys complained that he'd been abused by a police inspector, John McLennan. Uh, after, co after conviction, the solicitor then went on to threaten to reveal the names of many highly placed uh, gay men in the colonial administration. The police responded by setting up the Special Investigation Unit, the SIU, which effectively began a witch hunt against the gay community known as Operation Rock Cory. It revealed that a large, a large number of powerful members of the administration were part of the gay community, leading to the public impression of selected prosecutions and the general impression of victimization of the gay community. Uh, tragically, the, this resulted in McLennan uh, after he was accused and fe feared he was about to be arrested committing suicide. Um, I say that this obviously self-destructive policy of prosecution was driven by a rule of law uh, because it must be remembered that this is Hong Kong in the aftermath of the corruption scandals that led to the formation of the ICAC. So in 1978 and 1979, when, uh, when the pol senior police were being faced with these complaints about criminal conduct amongst senior administration members, they could not afford to ignore it, lest they themselves become the uh, target of the ICAC. Uh, the government uh, uh, as a whole couldn't afford to ignore these complaints. Uh, and you'll remember this is uh, McElhose's government. Uh, so at the same time, it couldn't afford uh, the destruction and so uh, on the one hand, they couldn't afford to ignore it. On the other hand, they socially and politically could not afford to do what they needed to do, which was to uh, pursue the gay community. Uh, so provoked by McLennan's death and a public petition for decriminalization in 1979, the government initiated a commission of inquiry, first into the death and the, uh, and the other prosecutions by the SIU, uh, which ultimately led to the referral by the governor to the Law Reform Commission on the question of decriminalization. Uh, this is pretty similar to what had happened in England in the 50s and 60s leading up to the 1967 Act. Uh, because uh, in, in England, it was the Wolfenden uh, report that arose out of the Montague prosecution and, and the tragic events after that. Um, now, uh, I put this period between uh, 1981 and, and 1991, precisely because it didn't all happen in one go. Uh, there was broad public consultation by the Law Reform Commission, but that didn't really help because the Victorian and colonial social trends by that time had taken hold and had re-engineered in the public mindset homophobia as an aspect of Chinese morality. So by that time, 70% of the public were saying they supported, or at least those responding to the Law Reform Commission, uh, said they supported criminalization of homosexuality. But despite this, the Law Reform Commission recommended decriminalization on the basis that homosexuality was a crime with no victims, 
that certain conduct should be protected precisely because it is private and really no one's business. And, uh, and prosecution of, for notions of immorality are both difficult and divisive. Um, and the law reforms, law reform commission's general approach to public opinion in, in the report, which is very interesting uh, because of who who were the drafters of the report, uh, including the future uh, chief justice of Hong Kong, uh, basically painted the public opinion as ignorant, including ignorant about Chinese history. Uh, nonetheless, the government declined to put a bill forward because it was clear that a that this kind of reform would be unpopular. Uh, at the same time, McElhoes seemed to be keen to uh, give some support to the LGBT community. And it's ironically in the same year that the government uh, gives uh, support to gender reassignment surgery. Uh, and I, I should say, while all this is happening, uh, the McElhoes government uh, begins to uh, broach the subject of post-1997 Hong Kong. And in 1979, McElhose actually goes to China. And then in 1982, uh, the British government formally begins negotiations with the mainland uh, on, on the handover leading up to the 1984 joint declaration. Now, why is that important? Because decolonization itself was not popular in Hong Kong. The British government was pressed by the Hong Kong public to provide assurances that our way of life would con continue to be maintained after 1997. So a key aspect of the government's uh, plan regarding that was to enshrine human rights uh, through the ICCPR. So this led to discussions on incorporating the ICCPR into domestic legislation that would become the Hong Kong Bill of Rights. Now, it should be said that it was not, it probably it doesn't seem to have been intended that this would affect the rights of LG, LGBT people. But by 1981, it was becoming obvious that inevitably it would. Uh, this is because um, in 1981, the Belfast gay rights activist, who I very foolishly didn't put a picture of, uh, Jeff Dudgeon, won his case before the European Court of Human Rights, challenging the law of private, uh, basically the law against buggery, which although it had been repealed in England and Wales, continued to be part of the law uh, of the other nations in the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Uh, he brought a challenge to the law and was successful, and particularly successful on the basis of the right to privacy and equality. In effect, uh, the equivalent of the buggery offenses in our own offenses against the person ordinance were declared to be incompatible with those fundamental rights guarantees. So the McElhose uh, administration realized that the, uh, that the same sort of case could be brought before the courts if the Bill of Rights were promulgated. Fearful of such a challenge, the government sought to bring legislative reform for debate. And I've put there the beginning of the Hansard. Uh, hopefully you can all see that, the beginning of the Hansard for the debate on the motion. This is before they brought forward the Crimes Amendments Bill. They, they invited LegCo to debate whether or not there should be such a reform at all. Um, uh, given their right at the beginning uh, of uh, the Chief Secretary David Robert Ford's speech, uh, but later on in the speech, he very, uh, very importantly says this, if you enact a law and do not enforce it, you are condoning what you condemn. A vote against uh, the motion before this council will be a vote against condoning and in favor of enforcement. And henceforth, the government would be obliged to seek out and prosecute all, both high and low, who infringe against the law, despite all the problems I have mentioned. In other words, what he was saying was, you are going to make the law an ass and you will compel this government in order to protect the rule of law to continue the SIU Operation Rock Quarry witch hunt. And the government uh, using this threat and at the same time pointing out that inevitably there would either be a challenge or there would be, uh, there would be legislation uh, managed to get the bill through. Uh, now you might think immediately everything is going to be fine in Hong Kong, but of course th that's <laughs> far from the case. Uh, in the post-decriminalization de period, we, we don't see a sudden onslaught of, of litigation relating to uh, LGBT rights. Um, instead, we see uh, the period marked really, from my perspective, by two things. On the one hand, the reorganization of the organization of LGBT rights and the human rights movement. And on the other hand, we see a, a fundamental shift in the political structure in Hong Kong, which changes the government's attitude. 
Now, that's important to remember because in pre-1997, pre-decriminalization, uh, uh, the government essentially wants reform. Post-1997, we see the government doesn't want reform. Uh, during the public debate on the Bill of Rights, uh, coalitions had begun to form uh, with those advocating particularly for gender equality, but also non-discrimination protection for women and other minorities. And when the government, uh, the British government were pushed for more and faster democratic representation in the lead up to the handover, the governor appointed two new members of the Legislative Council, Anna Wu and Christine Lowe, partly as a nod to these groups. In the subsequent session of LegCo, Anna Wu used her platform to draft a private member's bill demanding an equal opportunities ordinance and the creation of an equal opportunities commission. The bill she drafted, or she drafted two bills, but one of them is important precisely because it adopted a broad set of categories for protection from discrimination, including both gender and sexuality, which she included after meeting with gay rights groups such as AIDS Concern, Hong Kong AIDS Foundation, and Horizons. Seeing the possibility that her bill might pass, the government reacted by proposing piecemeal legislation uh, part of which we have now, the sex discrimination ordinance, the race discrimination ordinance, et cetera, uh, in order to avoid divisive protections for uh, minority groups, particularly sexuality and uh, religion. At once, uh, Anna Wu's story, in my opinion, is a, is a story of defeat. But on the other hand, it laid the groundwork work not only organizationally by, by having these groups coalesce as identifiable or organized groups. Uh, but on the other hand, it laid the groundwork for principles that would later become part of government policy. Uh, the government would and has consistently defended its attitude towards protections for LGBT groups by saying that legislation is unnecessary and divisive and because discrimination can be reduced by other methods, so persuasion and policy. And uh, we can see a direct outcome of this is the government's own policies on introducing equal opportunities language into their own job uh, advertisements, employment policy, and also the promulgation, promulgation of the code of practice on discrimination and employment on grounds of sexual orientation. Now, I have a lot to say about that particular code of practice, including that it's fairly useless. But on the other hand, it uh, it, if you like, establishes as a matter of government policy, and, and that's relevant to the courts, that discrimination and unequal treatment uh, are not only unconstitutional, they're contrary to government policy. Uh, in, in the meantime, as I say, many other groups had uh, formed to advocate LGBT rights and for change in public attitudes, a trend uh, that has continued, and, and I would say cautiously has seems to have abated uh, since about uh, 2020. But at least at this time, uh, we saw with, with uh, the why I say it ended in 2020 is obviously the advent of the national security law. But before the national security law, we saw a, a large number of LGBT groups. Now, I want to highlight one particular group and one particular activist a, as an illustration. In 1998, we had the formation of Rainbow Action. Uh, who by 2002 were protesting marriage laws and restrictions on access to public housing for same-sex couples, uh, which we see in the human rights litigation period really sets the scene. Uh, here I've given you a, a picture uh, on the right. This is Tommy Chen. Uh, he's a, a pretty impressive uh, activist. Uh, you, see, uh, you see him there protesting at Central Police Station by chaining himself to the fence. Uh, and on the left, you see him in 2002 uh, him and his partner, as well as a, another, a lesbian activist and her partner, agreed that they would marry between the two groups so that each of them could apply for public housing benefits. Um, now, we don't see litigation, but we do see uh, the ideas that, there, that these are the fault lines for, uh, for the, the changes in LGBT rights coming forward through activists like this, uh, which rather leads into uh, the, the second trend that I wanted to mention, which is the after you have the Bill of Rights, you finally have the organization of a human rights bar, and I say bar, but really a legal sector that is interested and focused on human rights litigation, which you don't really have before, uh, before 1991. Uh, for example, uh, a, a key example would be Pam Baker, who used to be a government lawyer working in legal aid, 
uh, during the G a Vietnamese refugee crisis. In 1990, she was quite frustrated that she could give people legal aid, but there weren't really any firms who were specializing in handling the uh, human rights cases. So she quit her job and formed Pam Baker & Co. Uh, now, why is this so important? Because Pam Baker, you don't see her, I think, on any of the LGBT rights cases. But what's important about her is she then recruited from overseas specific human rights focused solicitors, uh, most notably Mark Daly, who in turn uh, recruited Michael Vidler. And you can see that a great many of the cases that come after this period are brought by these people. Um, at the same time, you can see that the government's attitude shifts. It goes from, uh, it goes towards one of minimum concession. And that's partly explained by the pressure of the increasing human rights litigation uh, balanced against a, a, a stagnation, if not a regression in political development. Uh, because at the time of the handover, the central government rejected much of Patton's political reforms. And so we saw a traditional local political uh, uh, scene that had existed before the democratization in the, in the mid-90s uh, suddenly rolled back. And not, so now you have uh, more traditional groups that are not only remaining in power, but they're increasing in power and, and political influence in the post-handover period. So from this time onwards, we see the government is largely unable to legislate for increased LGBT rights and only able to do so where it is forced to do so uh, or where it can be divorced from the issue of homosexuality itself. Uh, now, um, on the left, you see a very good friend of mine, but also a personal hero, uh, Billy Lum, in 2004, who at the age of 20 decided he was going to challenge uh, not the buggery law, not on the basis that it was illegal, but that on the basis that the age of consent was different for gay people uh, as compared with heterosexual people. Uh, he brings a case against the Secretary for Justice, uh, uh, Lung T.C. William Roy. I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of it. And the case is very similar to the Dudgeon case, and it's fought on privacy and equality grounds, uh, attacking the incomplete decriminalization. Uh, it's argued on, uh, you see here um, on the right, you see M Michael Vidler, who, who brings the case on behalf of, uh, of Billy Lerm, and it's argued by Phil Dykes, who uh, uh, maybe you all remember, the former bar chair, but also the, one of the two main drafters of the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance. Uh, now, this case is very interesting because it marks the change in government policy. The government, uh, government's opposition is fairly meek. They appeal the decision made at first instance, but they only appeal it to the Court of Appeal. Um, afterwards, they do not uh, follow the, what the Court of Appeal says. They do not repeal the legislation. They allow it to remain on the books, albeit defunct. Uh, there's no review of remaining discriminatory legislation. And the same year, uh, the government, if anything, uh, demands that uh, British and other consulates in Hong Kong cease to perform same-sex civil partnership ceremonies. Uh, but uh, it, it's in a way, it's too late. Uh, the, the floodgates have opened. And the next year, we see a criminal uh, appeal brought by, in the case of Zigo Yao, challenging charges of buggery in a public place on the grounds that, well, no such charge applies to heterosexual people. Uh, again, the government takes no steps to remove the unconstitutional legislation, even after they lose. Uh, and at the same time, LGBT rights groups begin their own public surveys on issues relating to them. Uh, the most important is the one on uh, domestic violence in same-sex families. Uh, in 2008, the drumbeat continues. Actually, I, I should probably mention a case that doesn't really get mentioned very much. I put it up on that list, which is the W&W &W case. Uh, previous to W and W, and previous to the Bill of Rights, uh, homosexuality itself was a was a claim that you would make in family uh, disputes. You would say, "Oh, my spouse is gay. My spouse is a lesbian. They're unfit to parent." And to, in two thousand and five, we see the first case where the family court judge says, "No, no, that's that's not relevant at all." And uh, and you can see that that uh, the Billy Lung uh, and the equality cases they begin to seep into these other areas of, of law, uh, and by 2008 you have uh, when the RTHK uh, censored the gay lovers documentary you have another case brought in the case of uh, Showman Kit which again is successful uh, and the government don't appeal. 
uh, but pressed by the threat of litigation and public condemnation by the uh, Human Rights Committee and a further consultation by academics from the Chinese University. Uh, Rehan, I remember you earlier telling me it's part of the duty of the university to participate in, in public knowledge. And it, it's very telling to me, I, I mentioned earlier the public survey conducted by LGBT rights groups on, uh, say, on um, domestic violence in same, uh, among same-sex couples. This university followed it up uh, in 2008 and published its own survey. And the government reacted to these criticisms and this and, and this uh, academic sur survey by drafting what would become the amendments to the domestic violence ordinance, which is now called the domestic and cohabitations relations uh, relationships violence ordinance. Now, uh, this is very important because we see in the debates in LegCo, the government is having to give public assurances publishing the bill that emphasize that they're charting a middle path. They are doing what is minimum to provide equality, but they will avoid any recognition of homosexual relationships as valid. Uh, this is the only way they can get through uh, legislation. Later on, and you, you'll see there that I've uh, mentioned the case of W and the, sorry, W and the uh, Registrar of Marriages. After the Court of Final Appeal, here, here's the appeal in that case, and orders the, the government to consider legislation. The government again tries to uh, draft legislation and ultimately fails to put it through LegCo precisely because uh, there is no uh, consensus, there is no majority that will allow it, not in the LegCo, that will allow them to, to proceed with these kinds of changes. Um, th this debate regarding a recognition, status, and marriage has, in my view, become the focal point for much of the litigation that has followed uh, Billy Leung and the Zigo case. Um, it marks a shift in the formal policies of the government. They no longer seek public majorities in favor of reform. Instead, they speak of a, a different kind of consensus. What they really mean is consensus amongst their political uh, 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 a constituency, not a consensus among, amongst the public. Uh, and this is telling because it, when W was argued, uh, the government specifically said, oh, we shouldn't have uh, reform to allow for uh, a, a transgender woman to, to marry as a woman uh, by relying on the absence of a, pub, of a social consens consensus and instead relying on antiquated notions of uh, gender roles and marital relationships. The, it, it's important because the CFA rejects this but the government persists in it. And even in the later cases like QT, uh, Angus Leung, and later the Edgar Ng and Henry Lee cases, the government maintains you must look at, at, at the public view, even though the courts continue to reject this. And that's very interesting because the government relies on uh, academic polling uh, of the public on what public attitudes are. But by 2019, 2020, government, uh, public attitudes have shifted so that there are now majorities in favor of recognizing these relationships. But government, uh, government attitudes do not change. Uh, and that's really because, uh, the, uh, because of the opposition to the underlying larger political social movements, um, which, which are, uh, i.e. I, I, the government's own attitude towards democracy and democratic feeling. And on the other hand, it's reliance on polit uh, certain political constituencies to maintain local control. The, the reaction of LGBT rights uh, movement has been in view of the government's uh, obstinacy is to focus on legislation, uh, on litigation rather than legislation and incremental changes through the courts. Now, uh, in, in my view, this is obviously not ideal. Changes of this nature are piecemeal and they prolong the suffering of these historically oppressed minorities. But they also prolong what has been a very divisive social debate and undermine Hong Kong's international re reputation, uh, aside from being ex extremely expensive. I mean, any one of these cases is millions of dollars in, in, in government costs, legal costs, and of course, in the meantime, uh, these people continue to suffer. Um, now, uh, at this point, I think I'm going to move past the, if you like, historical overview and kind of uh, go through um, a, a sort of summary of 
how the litigation, the litigation strategies relating to LGBT rights are patterned. Uh, the first is to recognize there are basically three common arguments. Uh, I put them in a diminishing order. Uh, the first is equality and non-discrimination, which is particularly favored by, uh, by the court. Uh, often a comparison is made and it's said that the treatments uh, faced by LGBT groups are detrimental or, or less favorable, and therefore there is discrimination unless it can be justified. Uh, so far, there have been, I think, almost no uh, successful justifications. The only one which has been successful so far, and we'll talk about it in, in a little while, is in the case of complete recognition of marriage. And even that has not been justified on a proportionality basis. Instead, it's been justified on the basis that there's a caveat in the constitutional uh, provisions regarding marriage. The second argument that's put forward, which has been very successful, although in, uh, in recent times is largely ignored by the court, is the right to privacy and family life. Uh, this was the, the winning argument in the Dudgeon case to say, well, sexuality is really a matter for the individual or, or, the, or their immediate family. It's not something that the government should interfere with. And then finally, and perhaps the least successful argument is one based on liberty and dignity. It's much favored by activists. And uh, of course, naturally, we may all feel very strongly about it. But in terms of uh, success in the courts, it's been fairly unsuccessful. Making these arg arguments, uh, it's tempting to think about it as one big issue, but in fact, uh, the way that most of the activists look at it is looking at it uh, as a, a series of, uh, of rights and, and benefits. Um, and you can see that there's pretty much been litigation covering all of these different areas, but it has gone piece by piece. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, really we've seen two different strategies adopted by uh, the, the activists. You have what I'm calling the slice by slice approach, which is to target a particular aspect of a benefit or detriment and attack that as something which is not justifiable. Uh, you can see I have uh, both a sweet tooth and a fixation on wedding cakes. Uh, the second approach is to try to obtain complete recognition for status, complete equality. Uh, and we see this in the MK and STK uh, cases, which have been largely uh, uh, unsuccessful. Although I should say, I think STK is on appeal to the court of, uh, to the court of final appeal. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I thought I might now go to a quick summary of what has happened, what has changed and, and where the case law fits. Um, how are we doing for time, Rehan? So we have about fifteen minutes left. Okay, so I'll go. I'll go pretty quickly. I just, I think these slides may be shared later, so I'll go very quickly. Great. Great. Uh, yeah. So you see here, um, and uh, I, I must credit, although I, I'm also involved in in drafting this. Uh, uh, Michael Vidler helped me to draft this. So we, we drafted it together. Uh, you can see here we have on, on the left uh, marriage itself uh, in Hong Kong. Sorry and uh, so far unsuccessful in M MK and STK. Uh, but on the other hand, in the middle, we have uh, the Balaoro case. So Reverend Balaoro, who was, uh, who was uh, conducting religious ceremonies, was initially arrested, and then the government back backed down, and, and, and he wasn't prosecuted. Uh, and then we have a specific recognition uh, of marriage conducted abroad in these particular cases for particular purposes. Uh, in the area of family and, and IVF, we see as in beginning a family, there's actually been relatively little litigation. Uh, I'll be frank with you, you can see on the right as the case I did A and BB, which uh, established that the courts could give joint custody to same-sex couples, so both couples could share in the legal uh, responsibility for the for the child, but we haven't seen yet um, cases dealing with uh, availability of IVF and uh, parental orders. Now, I was said I was going to be uh, frank with you and honest with you. Uh, there is actually a case which will be argued in February, which will deal with um, with uh, the if you like the middle one there. Uh, uh, what happens when you have a child born in IVF uh, through something called ROPA? Uh, which is reciprocal IVF or shared motherhood, where the egg comes from one mother and goes into the other mother who gives birth to the child, but the parties are married, albeit abroad. 
so far, there have been no joint adoption cases, but uh, there have been uh, many uh, cases of uh, LGBT uh, couples where one person in the couple will adopt the child. Sometimes they adopt the child of the, of the other person. So that is already happening. Uh, surrogacy, that's really the, the same as we've discussed before. This is not really available in Hong Kong. We are, we are waiting for a case to come up, which will deal with uh, an application for a surrogacy, but it hasn't come up yet. Um, in adoption, as I say, there have been, uh, so there's another case I was involved in, the REM case, uh, but uh, so far, uh, really, if you want a joint adoption, you have to bring that adoption with you from overseas because the law in Hong Kong will recognize an adoption that took place abroad, but will not allow you to initiate a joint adoption in Hong Kong if you're in a same-sex married couple. Uh, now, we, we mentioned before uh, uh, Tommy Chen and, and his attempt to, to get uh, same-sex married housing which was not really a direct challenge, but subsequently we've seen both uh, home ownership scheme and uh, uh, public rental housing uh, uh, attacks, both in the Infinger and the Edgar Ng case. Both of those are currently under appeal. Uh, in the area of medical issues, we see in public sector civil, uh, medical benefits, we have uh, Lung Chung Kwong, uh, a successful case, which we did a few years ago. In tax, same thing, Lung Chung Kwong. Uh, in the area of child arrangements, as I said, in the case of A and BB, we've already had uh, uh, the, the allowance of this idea. But what we haven't had is what happens in divorce. What happens when the couple splits up? What happens if you're divorced abroad? Now, uh, this has not been challenged yet. I've had several clients come to me, and then we're about to bring the case and then they leave Hong Kong or something else happens and the case doesn't come forward. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, there's been almost no movement here. In the case of inheritance, we've had uh, the case of mm, uh, uh, Edgar Ng, which is again currently under appeal, but which was successful. Yeah, great. I'm sorry we rushed through it there at the end, but frankly, a lot has happened. No, thank you very much, uh, Asana. It was really, really interesting. And I, I particularly appreciated how you highlighted, I think, some aspects that don't maybe get as much attention, um, like abortion, and like the first W versus W case, which isn't usually mentioned here. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, members of the audience, you're welcome to send in questions via the chat. Um, while they're doing that, can I start with a question for you, um, Azan, which is sure. about the the kinds of purposes that the that the Hong Kong courts have found compelling as reasons to kind of recognize um, same-sex marriages and or adoptions, et cetera. It seems like, I'm thinking about the QT case here in particular, it seems like kind of the, uh, the idea of attracting talent to Hong Kong and kind of, you know, allowing people to come with their spouses in that case, and I'm assuming adoption is similar for that reason, seems to be a kind of compelling reason um, for courts to permit um, or to recognize same-sex marriages or adoptions from abroad while limiting it here. So I was wondering the degree to which that factors into the litigation strategy. Is that something that folks are looking to do, kind of try to sort of, sort of, maybe, I guess, promote the economic benefits? Is that one way to kind of get to the courts rather than kind of, as you say, because liberty and dignity don't seem to really work so well, um, at least in the litigation so far. So is there a focus on kind of trying to say, look, there's some economic benefits that come with this, or try to get to some other kind of benefit that comes with recognizing um, gay rights? In, in QT, those arguments were certainly brought up, but I, I would... I would disagree that that's the way the courts have been thinking about it. They they don't think about it as though you need to provide a reason for equality, um, at least not uh, not explicitly. Uh, they're saying more when there's an inequality is for the government to provide a justification. Now that said, the activists and the litigants have clearly chosen cases with the intention that they will be um, uh, sympathetic. Hmm. That it will be uh, that they will demonstrate that not not only are there no good reasons to to deny equality, but there are good reasons to give equality. And and certainly in in working on the cases that we always make that effort. Uh, the cases uh, the, the there's a case which is coming up which 
uh, I, you, you know that there are problems, you know that they exist, you know that there are people that look, actually a, a really good example is Edgar Ng and Henry Lee. Uh, Edgar Ng and Henry Lee, they bring two cases. One case, I will actually bring now more than two cases, but when Edgar is still alive, God rest his soul, uh, they bring two cases. The first one is related to inheritance. The second one is related to home ownership scheme flat. The inheritance case, that is not the first time I or other, um, other lawyers working in this area had seen clients complaining about that. But uh, the the case only came forward in, with such a direct challenge because it was very hard to deny the justice of it. There were other less sympathetic people that you could have brought a case forward with, but you just don't want to chance it. You don't want to risk it. This is strategic litigation. And most of the time, a, a good deal of the work that's been done has been done by strategic litigators looking for the right case to bring forward. But it's not true to say all of the cases have been like that. In fact, many of them have not been strategic. The W and W case is not a strategic case. That was just a, I mean, that woman was getting divorced and she had a particularly unpleasant husband who was particularly upset because she, she was a lesbian. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, you have cases like MK. Uh, MK is not a strategic litigation case at all. Uh, or, or if it is, it's not being brought, not, not really by, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying there are no strategic litigators involved, but the catalyst for that is accident and maybe one person's desire. But a lot of the other cases are strategic. They're brought by people who have been planning it for years. And if we go back to that slide that I'd shown you with Michael Vidler, I mean, you, you, uh, he had been thinking about the issue for years. He had been looking for the client for years, someone willing to do it. Uh, Billy Lung happened to be 20, I think it was 19 when they started applying for legal aid. Um, in the in the case of QT, I, I know for a fact that, that Michael Vidler had been looking for that client for years. In, in Angus Lung's case, we, we had been looking for that client for years. It's just waiting for the right person to show up uh, who's, who's, uh, who's willing to go through what is a very tortuous process because you know the government will appeal it to the court of final appeal. The case, uh, Billy Lung is the really the last time we see these a, a, cru a crucial turning point case end below the CFA. All the other cases, if they don't end in a in a government success, they will keep going up. Feeling it. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. So a couple of questions have come in. The first is from my colleague Stuart Hargreaves, who says, "What do you make of the lower courts' move in the last couple of years?" to rely upon their sense of, quote, intent of the drafters of the basic law, Ray, marriage in rejecting the shoot the moon cases. Yeah. Um, my uh, my issue with that approach is that it's, it's a historical. It, it's not, uh, they were not thinking about that problem. They were not thinking about that concept. <laughs> Excuse me. It's like if we'd had, if we lived in a time when there was, when there were anti miscegenation laws. And it, there was a time and place when in Hong Kong, if you were a Christian, you have to marry in a Christian wedding. But now we live in a society where we don't, people are not cut up into these different groups. We allow, we're going, we, we, we acknowledge now we have a society which is more equal. And now we're going to start allowing these people to exist. So when those laws are written, there is no, uh, homosexuality is criminal. It, it's not only not, it, it's not only socially rejected, it is a crime. We are now living in a world post the, uh, that drafting, where now we're asking a question, a question, what do we do these people now that we acknowledge they have every right to be here and, and be who they are? And, and so I think in a way, it's, it's, not, it's not really allowing the law to speak in a changing environment, uh, you know, there's that canon of interpretation always speaking. I, I know that the the courts take different views on how far this canon should go, but from my own perspective, it, it's uh, you are really are wrenching a law into a circumstance which it's not anticipated, and instead we should look at the first principles. So, I, I, frankly, I don't think very much of it, but that is how what they've said so far. 
Great. And final question from our Dean, Lutz Christian Wolf, says, thank you for a great talk. You focused on the past and the present. Can you also share your views about the future? With so the change I, of public perception, real LGBT rights, will there be further development towards equal treatment? Which I think is something you intended to cover. So now- yeah, I, re I intentionally removed that slide. <laughs> yeah, so okay. I think we'll give, we'll give you an opportunity to just say something quickly to end there. Yeah, I, I my own view is you will have more people, well, I know because some of those cases are coming on, you will have more piecemeal attack. The next areas I expect will be in the area of private discrimination, uh, uh, probably joint adoption, um, You these other narrow, and then finally, I think you will see something in divorce because in, in a way that the Court of Final Appeal in QT teed up this uh, topic when they said, um, well, you, it'll be very difficult to justify same-sex marriage recognition in divorce because why would you need it? You're already, your marriage is already voided, right? Uh, well, there, there is an answer to that because in divorce, there's a whole set of other benefits that come with the divorce process. It's not only the dissolution of the marriage. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that actually there is a clear, uh, there is a clear difference because a... Um, even a void marriage can be declared null by the courts. And that is an alternative form of divorce. And that's available to same sex married, uh, to opposite sex married people who are in marriages which aren't legally valid, but it's not available to same sex people whose marriages aren't legally valid. So it's very difficult to, in my view, justify why the divorce jurisdiction should be denied to same-sex married people. And, and frankly, if you live in a society where you can get benefits as though you're married, you can get dis your marriage dissolved as though you're married, you can get, uh, you can get uh, children as though you're married, then two things. One, what are we waiting for? There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing left. And two, it'll be very difficult to justify why a same-sex couple in Hong Kong should not be able to turn on that set of benefits. Because if you ask me that the final piece will be to say, well, uh, there should be something that I can do here. I shouldn't have to take a flight to Taiwan or Canada or New Zealand. But why am I being denied that? And once you have that, then the law, it, it will be truly absurd for the court to maintain the position in MK. That makes sense, especially if you know you have child custody here and assets in Hong Kong, et cetera. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Azam, thank you very, very much. Uh, this was a terrific talk. I think everyone benefited tremendously. So we really appreciate you taking oh, it doing this. It's my pleasure.